What a wonderful day we have today. We have so much to be thankful for today. You know, as I was singing that song, even doing rehearsal this morning, I realized that my life is not wrong. Because Jesus paid a price for my life and yours. He paid the ultimate price that we would be free from the penalty of sin, the burden of sin, God. that we would no longer be under the dispensation of the law or even the penalty of results of the law, that he's given us much grace and mercy with the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, and that all who believe in him could have eternal life. So, I'm just so thankful today. Uh, I could barely get through that just knowing and just feeling that just knowing that everything I've been through, he has been with me every step of the way, whether I realized it or not. Even when I wasn't walking with him, he was still watching down on me. Even when I wasn't walking with his light, he never turned his light off of me or any of us, for that matter. Before I start, I want to recognize Before I start, I want to recognize today is Father's Day. First of all, I want to recognize our Heavenly Father. As our father today. Let's our heavenly father. Let's stand and give our heavenly father. Praise this morning. Our heavenly father. For he is one who never turns his back on us. He is one who never leaves us. He is the one who never forgets a birthday. Who never forgets an anniversary. He never forgets that we are here. So thank you, Lord. Our heavenly father. Happy Father's Day. I also want to recognize our earthly fathers this morning. And I want to thank you guys for being here. Uh, and what our earthly father, who's standing, and give our earthly father a round of applause. We knew Pastor was going on vacation um, a couple of months ago. He does it this time of year, but. A couple of months ago, we talked about it, and we also talked about um, how we would handle the, the messages for Sunday while he was on vacation, give him a chance to rest uh, and uh, get re-energized. But, you know, I used to wear re-energized, but when you're walking with the Lord, you're always energized because there's so much in the spirit that he brings every single day. But having known this for several weeks, you know, and knowing that I would be here on Father's Day. And also, I have to thank God today because he's given me a, an extra year today. So I'm thankful for that. And uh, nothing that I've brag about except that God has blessed me. That's the only thing I can brag about this morning, that it's because of him that I still stand here. But knowing that I was going to give this message, I wanted to prepare a Father's Day message for the ages. I want you to, to hear me. I wanted to give a Father's Day message for the ages. That was something that, that they wanted. I wanted to tell all the fathers today what an honor it is to be chosen by the creator of the universe to lead the families that he's given us. I want to tell the fathers what a great responsibility as men we have to lead our families, to lead our churches, our communities, our cities, states, and our nation. Boy, what a world we would have if we had king of men operating with a kingdom agenda in every home, in every church, in every city office, in every state office, and even in the highest office of the land. Kingdom men with a kingdom agenda operating. Can you picture what the world would look like if we had just that? Wouldn't it be amazing? 
I want to remind all the fathers today that God is a God of order and he's a God of purpose. Nothing happens by chance and he wastes nothing. You know, even after he created the heavens and the earth and he filled the earth with all the beautiful and marvelous wonders, he decided that he would create human beings and created them in his image and his likeness. So you see, he took some dust from the ground and he formed the first man, Adam, and he breathed the breath of life into him and he became a living person. Now, understand, this was a created man the first man. So I want us all to remember Father's Day, of the first father, because he's the father of the entire world. Everybody came from the first man and woman. So we're all brothers and sisters here. We're all brothers and sisters. I want to remind the fathers that it was Adam that he placed in God. And as God looked down, he said, you know, it's not good for man to be alone. So he created the animals. Every animal that was scurry on the ground, big and small, and he brought them to Adam in the garden. And guess what he did? He gave Adam the responsibility of naming every animal that the God of the universe had created. Now, how cool is that? Just think about it. Can't you see Adam sitting there on a, on a, on a big rock? And uh, the lion walks up to him. Can you imagine a lion is walking up to you right now and what that might feel like, look like? But a lion walks up to him, bigger than them all get out, and he's got this big mane, and he's okay, what am I going to call you? You know, and maybe the lion may have been a little sleepy and he's he young and it's like, whoa. And Adam said, lion. Okay, I'm going to call you a lion. All right, but he was given the responsibility of naming all the animals. And I use the word God. That's the words that are going to be used that I might refer to because I want you to know that, again, God wastes nothing. He's a God of purpose. And everything he does leads to the next thing he wants to do and, and the, the next thing that he's doing in our lives. So remember that word responsibility. And I say that again because, men, we have such a responsibility. God also recognized that Adam needed a help. So from the rib about, about him, he fashioned Eve and brought Eve to him in the garden. Now, Eve would be Adam's equal partner in God's kingdom. Together, they were perfect human beings in a perfect world. If only our world was perfect today. I also wanted to say to the fathers today that God is holding us to a great accountability on how we lead our families. How we lead the families that he's entrusted us with. How we lead them in a godly manner. He tells us that when a man finds a woman, he finds what? A good thing. Come on, ladies. Come on. Let me start again. Because, you know, I know you, this is where you guys come in and you get a chance to, to, uh, to, to uh, participate. So he tells us that when a man finds a good, uh, finds a woman, he finds a what? A good thing. A good thing, as the ladies have just said. All right? That we should love her as we love our own body that she is first in our lives, only after God himself, that we should not mistreat her, lest our prayers be hindered. He also tells us that the children we are blessed with are a gift from our Heavenly Father, that we should raise them up in the way that they should go, and when they grow up, they won't depart. How we lead makes a dramatic difference in the lives of our families. How we lead makes a dramatic difference in our churches, it makes a dramatic difference in our communities and on and on and on. So fathers, can you see what impact we have starting in the home and how it translates to what's happening, what happens in the community? And if we look at where we are today in our world, we'll, we'll, we understand that we live in a fallen world. It's because of the first man then live up to his responsibility and lead his wife away from that uh, deception by Satan. Or even when the Lord came through, through the garden and said, hey, Adam, where are you? He didn't call Eve. He said, Adam, where are you? And they were hiding. And so Adam cried out. He said, well, we're hiding. He said, why are you hiding? He said, well, we were naked. He said, who told you that you were naked? And as it turned out, they disobeyed God. But Adam fell right in because he was right there. 
And rather than, I can only imagine, if you had just said, Lord, we have sinned against you, please forgive us. You know, maybe things might be a little different, but that was blaming on God. He said, you know that woman that you gave me? <laughs> she pulled that fruit, you know, took that fruit from, 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 from the serpent, and she ate some and then gave it to me. <laughs> Excuses. I want you to remember that word, too. You got two now. Responsibility and excuses, all right? It seems like the two of them are opposite poles, right? Responsibility and excuses, but the first man made an excuse. You're going to see some more excuses here as we talk. Recently, I saw a picture on LinkedIn. There was a man holding a sign up that said, you're not raising only your sons, but you're also raising someone's future husband, or father. So do it right. Again, coming back to responsibility. Fathers, our sons are looking to us to teach them how to be godly men. How to be godly men in the home. How to be godly men in the church. How to be godly men in the community. Our daughters are looking for an example of how they should be treated by a godly man. You hear me? Our daughters are looking, they're watching. You know, and I, and I have to think that, you know, as we say, the, the, the young people are leaving the church. And why? Are we giving them the right example? Are they seeing the right example? Are they seeing fathers who are leaving the families and providing them not only just the financial uh, needs or physical needs, but also providing them the spiritual nourishment uh, as well? We are responsible for that. So both our sons and daughters are looking for an example of how a godly man loves and treats his wife, how he cares for his family, and how he provides for them as well. That's what I want to say today on Father's Day to the men. But that's not what I came to say today, as it turned out. And I'll tell you a quick story. Having known that I would be here, I just knew that uh, I would have this message all wrapped up probably two weeks ago. But I'd say I had been so busy, I couldn't come up with anything, and I didn't put not one word to paper over the last two weeks. And it's because that's not really what the Lord wanted me to say today. That was what I wanted to say. Today's, the title of today's message is, Who's on the Lord's Side? Amen. Amen. And somebody said, wow. Well, you know what? That's what I said a week ago on Saturday. I was in my car headed over to, uh, uh, to the kids to see the kids and grandkids on last Saturday. And I was listening to um, a, a couple of messages. And as I'm driving, you know, I have my Bible app, so I listen to scripture. So I'm listening to scripture as well. And during one of those, uh, the words were uttered, who's on the Lord's side, are you on the Lord's side? And, and immediately I, I said, that, is that the title for the, for the message, Lord? And I'm thinking, well, you know, that's a song that we sing. It can't be the title of, of the message. And I said, and, and, you know, I'm still a human. I'm still a human until he takes me home. And I take on that, that uh, eternal uh, body. But I tried to make a bargain with the Lord. And I said, Lord, I'll tell you what. We usually get the songs that we're going to rehearse for Monday nights uh, on Monday afternoon. I said, now, if that song is on that list that I know it came from you. Well, let me tell you something. About 3.30 in the afternoon on Monday, I checked my email. And it was an email from Eugene Owens to all the choir members. And here's the songs for, uh, for rehearsal for June 19th, uh, uh, Sunday. And guess what the first song on the list was? <laughs> Who's on the Lord's side? OK? So I stand here very confident that the Lord wants to know today Who's on the Lord's side? Amen. Are you on the Lord's side? Or are you on your own side? You know, the last couple of weeks, we, we've heard great messages from Pastor Rob, uh, Reverend Rob and, and uh, Deacon Mario. Uh, we talked about breaking away from your past. We talked about who's on your team. And now we're going to ask the question, the Lord wants to know, are you on his side? Who's on the Lord's side? So I want you to turn your books to... Uh, to the book of Exodus, if you would. And we're going to do a little bit of reading, uh, but I don't think I'm gonna be very long today. 
uh, as I was joking with uh, Reverend Rock this morning, we were talking and uh, I sent him a message. He says, well, really? He said, oh, like we're going to be long today. I said, well, you know, we got to get to go to Korea. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, hopefully we won't be, be long. But he also told me, he said, you know, when, when the preacher says he won't be long, that, that means he's going to be long. So we're going to allow the Lord to do whatever the Lord wants to do here today. So if you turn your Bible to the book of Exodus. Now, what I want you, I want you to do is a picture of this. The Lord God, through Moses, led the people of Israelite out of Egypt after being there for 40 years in captivity. I'm sorry, 400 years in captivity. The people watched as God poured out his anger on Pharaoh in Egypt. Do we remember the, the, um, the tale, or not a tale, but the account of how God hardened Pharaoh's heart and all the plagues that he put upon the land? Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, just think about that. He, he caused the waters to become bloody. Frogs and flies and insects came into out of nowhere, and locusts came in to invade the land and made made everything difficult uh, for everyone, including the animals. It was dark for three days, and they said it was so dark they couldn't see their the, the, their hand in front of their face. They had to fight, feel their way around. Can you imagine that? It's so dark that you cannot even see your hand in front of your face, that if you move, go anywhere, you gotta kind of feel your way around with both your hands and your feet, at least you fall off a cliff or, or bump into something. There was hell, and as the hell hit the ground, it turned to fire. They witnessed all these things. They also witnessed the death of the firstborn of every household of Egypt. And those that were not killed was because they had the blood of a lamb, the blood of a lamb posted, smeared on their doorposts. Door the blood of a lamb. Remember that phrase, the blood of the lamb. And while this was going on, guess what the, the Israelites were doing over in, in, in Goshen? They didn't feel the same effects as the folks in, in, uh, in Egypt. When it was dark, they still had sunlight in Goshen. The Lord was protecting them. They did not suffer the same things or the same plagues as the people of Israel. So after Pharaoh let God's people go, they headed out probably two to three million of them. Can you imagine uh, walking out, Moses walking out, and the Arab being with them, and you got about two or three million people walking behind you and following you? Can you imagine what that looked like, the whole nation of Israel? And while they were on this journey, they also witnessed the following. They witnessed God being with them every day and every night. And they could tell because there was a cloud that was with them during the day, every day. And can you imagine walking outside and all the cloud is everywhere? Everywhere you go, that cloud is right still there. But he was right there with them every step of the way. And at night, there was a pillar of fire that lit up his presence, so they would know also that he was there. They were hungry in the desert, unable to capture any or kill any food, so guess what God did? God fed them with manna from heaven. Manna fell from the heavens, and it provided them with food and nourishment. They also, have you ever seen a quail in the desert, anybody? No. Huh? You don't find quail in the desert, do you? We even gave, even gave them quail to eat. And that could only come from God. They also uh, witnessed as God delivered them through the Red Sea as they were being pursued by the angry Egyptians. And God actually destroyed the Egyptians as they tried to cross the Red Sea as well while they were chasing the Israelites. They witnessed bitter water, guys, turn into water they could drink while in the desert. And then God led them to Elam, where they found 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they made camp there. See, he found a place for them to re-energize, to receive the water that he provided for them and give them up to have some rest. Also traveling in the desert, they became very thirsty and they witnessed uh, water coming from a rock that Moses had struck on the uh, instructions of the Lord 
after praying that the, that the Lord would give them water, the Lord said, Moses, would you strike the rock which was there? When they did, water flowed, and they were able to drink it and refresh themselves. And they even witnessed the Lord revealing himself and speaking to them. And again, the Lord's voice was so frightening, they begged Moses to ask the Lord to stop, to stop talking, or they would die. Now, I think what I've just read to you uh, is a pretty significant resume, wouldn't you say? I mean, that's a lot of uh, good stuff going on, and, and would I have any doubt the Lord is who he is by now? Would, would I have any doubt? Well, you would think with all of this, the Lord would have to do anything more to prove to his people that he was the true God, and that he alone, he alone deserves our worship, he alone deserves our praise, he alone deserves our obedience, but unfortunately not. Now it was on occasion that Moses had been up on Mount Sinai with the Lord for about 40 days. And while he was gone, the people became restless. Their flesh began to creep and crawl. They began to have desires that they wouldn't normally have expressed had Moses been there. So let's look at uh, Exodus chapter 32 for just a moment. Exodus chapter 32. We there? Yes. All right. And the word reads, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said. Make us some gods who can lead us. You hear this? Make us some gods who can lead us. Now you've just been delivered through the Red Sea. You've been rescued from 400 years of bondage. You've been given manna from heaven, quails in the desert. You got water that came from a rock. Now you want me to make you a god, okay, that can lead you. I must tell you that if I got to make my god, I don't need that one, because he can't do a thing for me. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses. Isn't that something that, you know, when, when the one that we're looking to, when he's not, we can't see him, okay? You know, uh, when we were kids, we would want to do something, we'd look around and see if mom or dad was around, okay? And then we go and, you know, my wife and I make uh, uh, talk about our grandson, Jalen. Now, Jalen was a good kid. You know, and if you told Jalen to do something, he was going to do it. Hey, Kyle, what's good? <laughs> Bless his heart. Bless his heart. He, was good. he had a lot of his daddy in him. So if you told him to sit down, okay, he would be sitting out as long as you were around. But boy, you, you walk up somewhere, and you, but he was off that couch. He was off of it. But when he heard you coming, <laughs> That's kind of how these people were. Just the way they were. Moses was gone. They need he, to find um, where he was and why he, he was gone so long. It really didn't matter anymore because they became restless. So I don't know what happened to the fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. Aaron, who's left in charge. So while Moses was gone, they, the, the Israelites, again, being in unfamiliar territory and left with less than strong leadership, they were, again, they were left with Aaron, and they sensed Aaron's weakness as a leader. They began to conspire to have Aaron make idol gods for them, and they believed that these idol gods could even lead them through the, uh, through the wilderness. It didn't take, as you're going to see, it didn't take Aaron uh, long. It didn't take much to get him to join the party. Let's continue to read. Let's go back to Verse 2, he says, so Aaron said, I want you to remember, Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded. Now, listen carefully. Aaron took the gold, melted it down, which means that he melted it down, and molded means that he molded into the shape of a calf. 
And when the people saw it, they exclaimed, O oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Can you believe that? How quickly do we forget? How quick, you know, Jesus used to ask the disciples, he asked the question of, he was looking at them sometimes, how long must I be with you? Okay? When are you gonna start listening and paying attention? When are you gonna remember what I have done for you in the past that I can still do for you in your future? Church, how often do we forget what God has brought us from? Because we're so focused on what we think our future is, we leave them out of it. Amen. And our desires, the things we want, we don't even ask the Lord, this is what you want for me. It's because that's what I want. So we leave them out. Verse 5. Aaron saw how excited the people were. So he, he built an altar. You know, not only did he build a fashion calf, but he also built an altar in the front, in front of the calf. And he announced, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. Now he gets Lord's feeling about this. Now, he's built a calf, he's fashioned a calf, he's built an altar, and they're gonna have a festival to the Lord uh, using this altar and this golden calf. And the people got up early the next morning to sacrifice burnt offerings and peace offerings. And after this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan reverie. Boy, I can only imagine it was quite a sight. You know, Aaron can see the direction that uh, this is going. And instead of standing firm and standing strong on the word of God and putting a stop to this, he joined in and it didn't take much to get him to do so. He said, bring me your gold. And he said, he took the gold that they were wearing from their necks. Having witnessed all that God had done for them, why would they need an idol God? They lacked true faith. Their faith was weak in the sight of God. They could not see a visible God. Just think, how do we feel together that at the end of every day uh, on our app or where it may be, we got a report card from God to say, okay, you, you, you failed here, 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 you did okay here. How will we feel if we got that every day? Would that make us more secure in who God is in our life? Do we need that? Is that what we need? To remember? Does it remind us every single day? They could not see God and all, and, and, and they needed something, or wanted something, I should say, that they could tangibly touch, they could tangibly see, they could tangibly put their, uh, their faith in. They saw the wonders they performed on their behalf, and you think that would be enough. They also saw the clouds moving with them every day. They saw the pillar of fire with them every night. They saw the manna from heaven. They were thirsty, and there was no water to be found. And God gave Moses the power to give them water through a rock. They even saw the Red Sea open up and let them across safely. And they watched as God slew their uh, pursuers in the same sea only uh, after everyone had crossed safely. Just as their ancestors had asked for a king, God even gave them a king who was Saul. I think we all remember how that ended. So fashion, Aaron fashioned this gold calf from the gold he collected. And the people tried to materialize God in this calf. I don't get it. They even acknowledged that they, uh, that the calf, the God, the idol God, brought them out of Egypt. And if this was not enough, Aaron made an altar again, which the people made sacrifices to. And again, again, to indulge in pagan reverie. Do you know what I mean about pagan reverie? That means they got so bad they were about in a, in a drunken stupor, a drunken orgy. They were doing everything that they wanted to do, that their flesh and desires wanted them to do. Let's go back to, uh, to, to uh, chapter 32, look at verse seven. The Lord Moses, and the Lord told Moses, quit. Go down the mountain, your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. And they melted down, they have melted down and made a calf. And they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of Egypt. How soon 
how soon they could get. Then the Lord said, I've seen how stubborn and rebellious these people are. Now leave me alone so my fierce anger can blaze against them and I will destroy them. Then I will make you, Moses, into a great nation. Now if you remember, God promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to make them a great nation. He promised Abraham that he would make Abraham such a great nation that his descendants would be greater than the stars in the heaven. But God's anger was such that he was ready to destroy the people uh, that he had chosen. And they start all over with Moses and making Moses name great in the universe. But Moses pleaded with the Lord not to destroy them. He reminded God of what he had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that he should not destroy the people that Upon Moses' request and his prayer, God decided not to go through. But what he really wanted to do was to bring all these people to justice. Now, if you think about it, Moses was up on the mount. And he went there actually to commune with God, but also to bring something back. And if we go over to, uh, I just want to flip, real quick over to chapter 20. In chapter 20, we see that uh, God had gave. Uh, Chapter 20, verse 1 says, Then God gave the people all these instructions. The instructions he gave were the Ten Commandments. And the first one says, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other gods but me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the likeness or uh, in, the, in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affections or any other gods. So they already had the law. God had given it to them verbally. They didn't have it on the stones yet, on the tablets yet. He had given it to them verbally. And they soon forgot they were bowing down to these out of wishes that Aaron had fashioned for them. But again, Moses came to the rescue, and uh, he pleaded that case. He asked God again not to destroy the people, reminding them of the promise for I, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And today, if we look at it, Moses was an advocate for those people. But we also have, a, have an advocate today, and our advocate is the living Christ, the son of the living God, who sits at the right hand of God, that God may see us through him. He paid the price for our lives by giving his. It was God who sent his son, his only begotten son, not to judge the world, not in the first visit anyway, but that the world be saved through him. And whosoever believed that Jesus died, was buried, and was raised from the grave by his heavenly father would have eternal life. He's the savior of the world then, and he's the savior of the world now. But yet so many still rebel against him and ignore his calling. Let's continue reading, verse 11. But Moses tried to pacify the Lord, uh, the Lord was God. O Lord, he said, why are you so angry with your own people who you brought out of the land of Egypt with such great power and such a strong hand? Why let the Egyptians say their God rescued them with the evil intention of slaughtering them in the mountain and wiping them from the face of the earth? Turn away from your fierce anger change your mind about this terrible disaster. You have threatened um, against your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You bound yourself with an oath to them saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars of heaven and I will give them all the land that I have promised to your descendants and they will possess it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the terrible disaster he had threatened to bring to his people. Continuing on. Then Moses turned and went down the mountain. He held in his hand two tablets uh, inscribed with the terms of the covenant. The terms of the covenant, covenant were the Ten Commandments, the law that God had given the people back as we look in chapter 20. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. These tablets were God's work. The words on them were written by God himself. 
Now, would you guys say, agree with me, that God's word is his, uh, our Bible records the inspired word of God? Do you agree with me on that? And we hold it in great reverence and respect. But what are we beholding God's word that he actually wrote himself? Just imagine Moses coming down, and he's got these tablets that God actually wrote on his own finger. And that doesn't make the law greater. But boy, I gotta tell you, that is so personal that I got it came directly from him. It wasn't written through the prophets, it was written by God himself. And he gave Moses the responsibility of carrying and delivering it to the people. When Joshua heard the boisterous voice of the people shouting below, he exclaimed to Moses, that, it sounds like war in a camp. But Moses replied, no, it's not a shout of victory, nor the wailing of defeat. I hear the sound of celebration. Moses had heard it before, and he recognized it as celebration and was concerned about what that might look like. When they came near the camp, Moses saw the calf and the dancing, and he burned with anger. He threw the stone tablets to the ground, smashing them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf that they made and burned it. Now listen, Moses took the calf and burned it. They ground it into powder, threw it into the water, and forced the people to drink it. You know why he wanted them to drink it? He wanted them to taste the bitterness of their own sin. He wanted them to understand that they had sinned a great sin against God by creating this calf. Finally, he turned to Aaron and demanded, what did these people do to make you bring such terrible sin upon them? You know, you ever ask a person why they did something and they don't have a real reason but they're searching, trying to find the best excuse they can find. Mm -hmm. You ever have a, had that experience with someone? Mm -hmm. I know sometimes we have with our children a lot. And our parents probably had it with us. And uh, in my day, we didn't say what, what had happened was, but you know, I'm sure that happens a lot as well. But Aaron said, and, and, and I really want you to hear this, because Aaron, uh, Aaron is something else. He, he, he is something to behold. Aaron said in verse 22, don't get so upset, my Lord. Aaron replied, you yourself know how evil these people are. And he's blaming on all the other folks, how evil they were, okay? You know, and if, if you go back and reread it, then I'm gonna twist Aaron's arm and say, you, you're gonna make this calf, okay? You better make this calf or we're gonna kill you. You know, they didn't do that. He said, bring me the jury, okay? All right, and he was the one who fashioned it, okay? Burned it, melted it down and fashioned into this, uh, into this calf. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. And when they brought it to me, I sent it through it into the fire. And get this, <laughs> and out came the calf. You hear me? Now, I wish Ollie was here, but see, this is, this is an Ollie Patterson moment. Have you ever seen Ollie's expression when somebody says something that doesn't quite make sense either? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I can only imagine, you know, when, 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 when we asked our children, why did you do that? And it was like, they give you the best excuse that, that they can find. You look at them now I know you don't speak to believe that. Come on, you can do better than that. And you gonna tell me that you took the gold jewelry, you threw it in the fire, and out jumped the calf? <laughs> Come on, man. Come on. And this, and this same calf that jumped out is one that you had to make, right? You had to make this calf. All right. Oh, Lord. Moses saw that Aaron had led the people into complete, uh, uh, allowed them to get completely out of control much to the amusement of their enemies. So think, come on now. When we get out of control, people just watch them. They just wait. You see, see, I told you. I told you. You just give them a, a, a little window, okay? Get away from church for a couple of hours, a couple of days. You know, they go to church on Sunday. Sunday, they pretty good. Boy, I took them on six o'clock to start the way off. And Monday morning, here they go. See, I told you. People just watch them, just wait to see if we are truly who we say we are. 
Are we on the lower side or not? Are we on the lower side? So he stood at the entrance of the camp. And this is where I want you guys to, to really stay with me here. He stood at the entrance of the camp and he shouted, all of you who are on the lower side, come here and join me. And all the Levites gathered around him. Now, the, the Levites were only one group of people who were with him. But he says, the Levites gathered around him. Not everybody in the camp. So I want you to understand that everybody that said that, that they're on the lower side is not really on the lower side. Now, what that means is that every one of us needs to search our own heart, our own mind, and determine if we're truly on the lower, on the lower side. Are we on this side based on what we do or just what we say? Huh? Both. We should be both. Yes, we should be both. But many are saying that they're on the lower side and they're not. If we listen to how the world is being misused, how the word is being used to take advantage of people. How the word is being used to become rich. How the word is being used. How God is being used uh, for someone's own ambitions. They speak the words, but not truly, truly on the side of the Lord. And God is asking today, guys. You know, I'm, I'm going to just gonna get right to it and stop right here. Moses is asking who's on the Lord's side. I got to tell you something. Who's on the Lord's side today? Anybody? Anybody? I want you to understand this. Making a choice and making a decision to be on the Lord's side, it takes more than just a hand clap. It takes more than just my word to say, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll join you. It takes action. Amen. So what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? You know, that line comes from a movie, uh, The Untouchables. I just thought of that. When the... Um, uh, Sean Connor was laying down in his house and he was about to die and he looked up at, at Elliot Ness and said, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to do? You're about to go to war. We're in a war, people. We're in a war. We're in a war with Satan because he's fighting us. He's fighting the Lord for our very souls every single day. What are you willing to do? Are you willing to allow the world to keep us away from the promise of eternal life that he's made for us? Are you allowing the world to make us forget what Christ did for us on the cross? Who's on the Lord's side this morning? Search your own soul. Search your own soul. And, and, and God knows. He knows our hearts. He knows our hearts. He knows when you're serious. He knows when you're not. I talked to someone uh, just uh, the other day, and they said, you know, I've got a problem with this free will thing. I said, why? He said, because we get to make choices and do all kind of crazy, people do all kind of crazy things. I said, I get it, I understand. I said, but we also get to choose Jesus if we choose him. We get to choose eternal life if we want it. So I'm going to ask you today, who's on the Lord's side? Are there things in your life that keep you from doing the things that you should do are the things in your life that, that take the place of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Is there anything that, that you spend more time uh, with than you spend with him? Is it work? Is it our homes, our cars, our children? Am I spending time trying to improve my, my status in the world? And my bank account? Is that the most important thing to me? Or is my relationship with Christ the most important thing to me? That places me on the Lord's side. Are we on his side today? It takes action. So I'm not asking you just to say, yes, I am. I'm not asking you to make the choice today, not yet. But just know that it takes action. Love is an action word, right? It's an action word. Love means if I love you, then I'll do all that I can to honor you protect you. And in loving God, he says we must love him with all our heart, mind, and soul and strength. And then we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And I just told you, Father, that you're supposed to love you, your wife like you love your own body. And I'm asking everybody here, can you love your neighbor as you love yourself? 
And in doing so, you are also loving God because you're following the guidelines and the, 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 the law. Although we're not under the dispensation of law, or I should say the penalty or results of the law, because with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, he brought a new covenant into the world, a covenant of grace and mercy. That if we do sin, and we're still sinners, saved by God's grace, should we sin, if we do sin, we can go directly to the Father and ask for forgiveness. We don't have to go to the pastor, we don't have to go to the priest, we don't have to drag a lamb in here and, you know, and, and kill it and lay it upon an altar. We can go straight to God and say, Lord, please forgive me for I have sinned against you. But our hearts must be right. Do we realize that what Jesus did on the cross made us right with, with God again? He gave us right standing with him again if we choose to. So I'm asking, who's on the Lord's side? I want you to think about this as often as you can. I'm saying this, who's on the Lord's side, as many times as I can because I hope that you leave here and it's probably two or three weeks. You, it's, whole, it's who's on the Lord's side? Anyway, who's on the Lord's side? It is in your mind, who's on the Lord's side? I'm on the Lord's side. Yes. Are you on the Lord's side? I'm on the Lord's side. I'm on the Lord's side. And how I prove it? I give him honor, praise, and glory every day before I do anything else. I thank him for waking me up each morning. I thank him for the word that he's given me that never returns void. Yes. I thank him for giving us a savior to save us from the penalty of our sins. I thank him for everything that I have. I thank him for my family. I thank him for just getting to work back and forth every day, those simple things. You know, guys, I've got to the point, and I, this is no, no brag, but I will tell you, again, I said earlier, the Lord allowed me to see the year, okay? And the older I get, my wife will tell you, the, the more I forget. <laughs> right, honey? And I, would, <laughs> and I would tell you, you know, I, I just want you to know that there are many times that I'll put something down, I can't even go back to it. I can't, you know, I, maybe it's just me, I'm just getting to know. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, the Lord said, that, you know, go back to where you were, and you'll be right there. I'm learning to say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But even the smallest things, I'm learning to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. When I'm in traffic, all right, and I want to take a deep tour and, 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 and try to get there faster. Well, I missed the exit, and what I realized is, is when I missed the exit, there was a whole bunch of traffic all the way up on the other side. So he steered me away from that, and I'm going to say, well, thank you, Lord. Thank you for that as well. And when people look at me, and they don't understand why I don't use the language that they use. I don't say the things they say. I don't laugh at the jokes they laugh at. The Lord strength, uh, strengthens me, and he holds me up steady. Because sometimes I'm the only one in the house, in the building, who's on the Lord's side. And you will find yourself there too. Now, our life as Christians is not a lonely life. Sometimes it may look like only a few of us are walking this direction, and a whole bunch of people going that direction. Yes. And because there are two paths, there's one narrow, and there's one broad. And the broad road is the road to destruction. The narrow path is the path to eternal life. It's not easy. We're going to have issues, but we have a Savior. And we also have someone who advocates on our behalf and speaks up for us to the Lord God Almighty. The Lord is asking me today, who's on your side? Is there anyone here today that hasn't made that choice that you want to be on God's side? You know, Mario talked about people on his team last, last week. He talked about having to get some people off his team. Well, I'm asking, who wants to be on the Lord's side today? If you've not made the decision, I'm asking you to come today and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life. Because he is really the only one that can save you. He is the only name by which we can be saved. Amen. And he is the only way we can get to the Father. But he is the, the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody can get to the Father except through him. But you must accept Jesus as Lord. Because he didn't want today who has made a decision. Who wants to be on the Lord's side. All right.
Okay. We also want to give anyone who has been with us, I don't see a lot of visitors, but if anyone is here today that would like to be a member who is not a member of Mission for Life Community Church, we would love to have you. We would love to have you. But we want to make sure that you pray about this and that this choice is one that you have guided instructions from and the blessings of the Lord. Because we want to make sure that when you join, that you just don't join and come and sit down. We need, people who, we need people who come to work, who come to do God's work, who come to do the kingdom's work. So no one came, all right? So I'm taking it that everybody in the building is on the Lord's side. Am I right? Let me, let, let me hear, let me hear. Are you on the Lord's side? You said it. You said it. So if you're on the Lord's side, this is what I want to ask you. I'm going to ask this of you. Show the Lord that you're on his side. Not with just your words, but with your action. Give him praise every morning for who he is in your life. Spend time in the word. I'm going to ask you, I understand that there are many who cannot be here on Wednesday nights. But I'm going to ask you, if you can physically be here on Wednesday nights for Bible study, I'm going to ask you to come. I'm going to ask you to do for God, what we've been doing with the world, I want you to arrange your schedule, arrange the things that you can arrange so you can arrange to be in the house of the Lord to study his word with God's people. There is power when we come together. Now I've watched the, 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 the uh, Bible study on Facebook a few times. I gotta tell you, I just don't get the same feeling when I'm, when I'm here. It's not the same. Now, I hear the word, it works good, but it's not the same. I'm asking you, if you say you're on the Lord's side, you need to make sure that you make some arrangements to be where he needs you to be so that he can talk and speak to your heart so you can understand who he is and understand what his desires are for your life. So I'm challenging you. Men, happy Father's Day again. Happy Father's Day. You deserve it. You deserve it. But remember this. God has a great responsibility he's given us. We should be honored that the creator of all the universe has given us the leadership of directing our families. It's such an important thing because every father and every son is going to be a father and a son and a husband. So let's make sure, one, that our fathers know that they're important to them, but fathers Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. So he who wants to be the greatest must also be a servant. So if you get a chance, Father, give your, give your family a break. Serve them. Serve them. You know, I've mentioned a couple of times that if you took a piece of paper, cut it in half, and you had your wife write down a piece of paper, all the things she does for, for you, and on the other side, you write down all the things that you do for her. If her side is wrong, then you got a problem. You got a problem. So we are here to serve, and that's how we lead. We lead by serving. All right. So we appreciate you guys listening today today's message. I hope that something said today has fallen on uh, fair ears. Now we're preparing for our worship to continue in our giving. And our choir, not our choir, but our musicians are going to give us another uh, another song. I think it's the uh, the Owens Boys are going to bring a song to us. So we always enjoy having the Owens Boys to to, uh, to bless us with a song. And while they come, guys, uh, please know, please know <coughs> that Jesus is coming back. And I don't think we got much longer looking at the what's happening in our world right now. And it's very important that you make a decision. Make a decision. You can't be neutral here. You're either for God or you're against him. There's no in between. There's no in between. And our God is a consuming fire. And you don't want to be on the opposite side of our Lord. So make the decision. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for your word heard here today. Father, we thank you for the occasion that we're here. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to bless us, um, provide for us. We thank you for giving us this day, Father, that we may uh, honor 
uh, our fathers as kingdom men and men that you have uh, given the responsibility, Father, of leading our families. We ask for wisdom. We ask for knowledge. We ask for strength and courage, Father, to lead according to your will. We ask, Father, that you help us to, to raise our sons and daughters to be godly men and women. And Father, we ask also today that you help us to be greater men for you in our communities. That we remember that when we're in the grocery stores or on the job, that we are also representing you there as well. So thank you for who you are. And as they come, our deacons come to, uh, to take our offering. We thank you, Father, for it. all that we receive today. And we honor you with how we use it, that we will use every single penny, Father, to further your kingdom work. So we thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.